In most of the cases we cover, the victims almost never survive. But against all odds, Alison Botha did. After you hear about the severity of her injuries, you will never believe how she survived her brutal kidnapping and attack. Are you ready to jump into this story? Let's go. On September 22nd, 1967, in Port Elizabeth, South Africa, Alison Botha was brought into this world. Alison's parents went through some issues in their marriage and eventually split up when Alison was just 10 years old. She had a younger brother and the two of them spent most of their upbringing living with their mother. Alison was a model student. In fact, she did it so well in school that she became head girl at the Collegiate High School for Girls. After graduation, she used her time to travel the world and experience different cultures. Once she had finished her trip abroad, she settled back in her home of Port Elizabeth. Allison entered the workforce and was very excited to get to work. She had scored a job as an insurance broker and excelled as an employee. Her life was relatively normal, that is, until the day of her attack. Allison and her friends decided they wanted to have a fun night. First, they hit up the beach and then they came back to Allison's apartment to eat dinner, play some games, and just hang out with each other. One of Allison's friends needed a ride home and being the good pal that she was, Allison obliged. After dropping her off, she drove back to her apartment. Allison had a pile of laundry in the front seat and planned on bringing it back to her place once she got home. She parked in her parking spot and unlocked her doors. And as she did, the driver's side door flung open. Standing there was a man, Franz Dutois, holding a knife. The man demanded that Allison move to the other seat, allowing him to get into the vehicle. He lied and said his name was Clinton. He explained that he had no intention of hurting her, but needed to use her car for an hour or two. He grabbed the wheel and he sped off to pick up a friend of Clinton's, Kienz Kruger in another part of town. Before, Allison was scared, but now two unknown men were sitting in her car. She was terrified. It was at this moment that Franz and Kienz told Allison their plan. They were going to take advantage of her and wanted to know if she would try and fight them off. In a horrifying moment like that, every awful possibility is running through your head. All you know is that you want to stay alive and you will do anything in your power to make sure that that happens. In awful cases like this, women will do their best to mentally prep themselves for terror that they're, that they're about to endure. With everyone in the car, they drove to an area far away from town. Both Kins and Franz took advantage of Allison. In her book, I Have a Life, Allison wrote that even though she was horrified, she knew things would become worse if she fought back. After both men violently attacked her, they decided that if she escaped, she would go straight to the police. And at that point, the men tried to suffocate her, but Allison fought against it. She passed out, but didn't die. When the men realized that that tactic would not work, they took their knife and stabbed her in the stomach 37 times. At that moment, the two attackers thought she was done for, but then her leg jerked. They realized that somehow, some way, she was still alive. And that's when they decided that they had to finish the job. They could not risk Allison surviving and turning them in. Then they took the knife and thrust it into her throat 16 times, nearly taking off her head in the process. Somehow Allison was still alive, but she played dead. She heard the two talking about what they had just done, joking around and saying, no one can survive that. The two left her body, which they believed to be dead, stole her car and drove back into town. Allison recalled that she was in such a state of shock that she couldn't feel the pain. She remembered her attacker slashing her throat multiple times. She was laying in the dirt and sand atop of broken glass and somehow managed to take her finger and write out the names of her attackers. After that, she wrote, I love you, mom. I cannot even imagine. So writing out the words, I love you, mom, like that's so heart wrenching to me. The next part of the story gets pretty graphic. Not that the first part wasn't graphic enough, but it's going to get more graphic. So if you're squeamish, I suggest sk just skipping forward a little bit. Allison realized that she was near a road and could see headlights from a car through the bushes. If she could manage to drag herself to the road, maybe she had a chance at somehow someone finding her and getting her to a hospital. She forced herself to stand and walk with incredible strength. Allison managed to make it to the road. She kept falling and going blurry, as you can probably imagine, but she fought tooth and nail to make sure she was sound. She ended up collapsing right on the divider line in the middle of the road. While on the road, a young driver, Tian Eilard, spotted Allison almost immediately. He stopped and did his best to keep her conscious while he was waiting for the paramedics to arrive. Thankfully, he was a student in veterinary school and used his knowledge to tuck her fully exposed thyroid back into her body. Allison was taken to the hospital immediately and what the staff saw completely shocked them. The doctor who got to work on her nearly three hour long surgery, Dr. Alexander Angelov, 
said he had never in all of his years of experience seen injuries that were as brutal and severe as hers. Allison was able to pull through because the knife had not severed a main artery. Over 50 plus stab wounds and somehow the attackers weren't able to end her life. She was able to keep breathing through a severed trachea. This woman is incredible. After her surgeries, Allison needed to stay in the hospital for weeks to recover. However, as soon as she was awake, she did her best to remember every single detail about the men who had done this to her. Authorities brought in pictures for her to look through and pointed out Franz and Kien's the second she saw their faces. As soon as she identified them, the men were in handcuffs. Obviously, the story was horrifying and the media ate it up. They started reporting on the two men, giving them the nicknames Ripper, which I get you want to sell newspapers, or have people tune into your show, but like, come on guys. The nicknames get so sensationalized sometimes, it's like too far in my opinion. What would come next was one of the most high profile cases to ever grace South Africa. Both men, Franz and Kienz, pled guilty to eight separate charges, kidnapping and attempted murder. It was a no brainer how this case would go. The two men pled guilty to all eight charges and they were sentenced to life in prison in August of 1995. Of course, the trial was merely the beginning for Allison. Maybe her attackers were in prison for the rest of their lives, but she had severe trauma from the event. It would take a lot of time before she could fully like feel like herself again. She knew that she couldn't let this keep her from living her best life. She needed to push through. She needed to confront the horrors that she faced. She needed to heal. She needed to help other people with her story. Allison went on to tour the world, visiting over 35 countries, spreading her story of hope and how she deals with her trauma every day. She said, believing that I could live the night of my attack and seeing the miraculous results of that belief is also a great life achievement for me. The personal emails and notes that I receive from people whose lives have been saved because they heard or read my story has to be the most rewarding and valuable achievement. They make it all worth the while. Allison has gone on to win multiple awards because of her courage. She was presented with the Courage Beyond the Norm Award and the Woman of Courage Award in 1995 and was given the title of Citizen of the Year in her home of Port Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Surprisingly, Franz contacted Allison while in prison. He wrote a letter asking for her forgiveness. Not only that, but he asked to receive profit from the tours, books, and eventually movies that would come from the attack. She declined each of his requests. I mean, it's the audacity for me. Can you believe the nerve that he asked for that? Even though the two men were sentenced to life in prison, any prisoners sentenced before October of 2004 are eligible for parole. The judge went on to say, I needed to make it clear that they were a threat to society and should never be released. A documentary film directed by Yuga Carlini was released in 1999 based on the very real and very tragic events of the case. She had the opportunity to interview many of the people who came into contact with Allison on the night of her attack. When they speak of her horrific wounds, they all break into tears. I cannot even imagine how strongly this affected the other people that night. What a horrific scene to endure. In 1997, Allison married a man named Tieni. In 2003, they gave birth to their first son, Daniel. Three years later, they had a second son named Matthew. Batha once said, my oldest son was about five when he had asked about the scar on my neck. I just said, mommy was hurt. And sometimes when you get hurt, you get a scar afterwards. And that was enough. They guide themselves in what they were able to digest. As they've gotten older and they can comprehend more, they've wanted to know more. When you think about the fact that her attackers tried to make it so she couldn't have children, going on to have two boys of her own is an amazing feat. Botha also said, life can sometimes make us feel like the victim. Problems and hardships and traumas are dished out to all of us and sometimes they can be divided very unfairly. Remind yourself that you do not have to take responsibility for what others do. Life is not a collection of what happens to you, but how you've responded to what has happened to you. And that, my lovely friends, is the end of our story. I know I just said a lot of words, but this case truly makes me speechless. I can't even comprehend something that awful happening and living to tell the tale afterwards. Truly, you have to admire Allison's strength and determination. She's genuinely an amazing woman. I hope she continues to travel and tell others of her story because it's truly inspiring. To everyone out there, please be alert and stay safe. I hope you join us on another episode of Killer Bites very, very soon.